send the certificate? Out. Okay, very happy. <laughs> So Arjit, I think I think that it's time is is ripe, so yes. I think we could start. Oh, you you want to start right now? Yep. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, to our four our sixth uh, uh, MPWB webinar uh, entitled uh, titled "Selection of Mega Voltage Treatment Technologies for External Beam Radiation Therapy: A Global Perspective." Uh, by a professor, Dr. Jake Van Dyke. Uh, Medical Physics for World Benefit is a non-for-profit organization whose vision is a world with access to effective and safe applications of physics and technology in medicine. MPWB's mission is to support activities which will yield effective and safe use of physics and technologies in medicine through advising, training, demonstrating, and or participating in medical physics related activities especially in low to middle, middle income countries. One of our objectives is to work with a spirit of collaboration by working with our colleagues, partner agencies, and national and international organizations to collectively improve patient care. Uh, before I go any further, I would like um, our past uh, president-elect, uh, Dr. Yakov Pipman, to say a few words. Um, thank you, Arjit. Um, I uh, welcome everybody to our sixth uh, session of the uh, sixth webinar. We started our webinars during COVID. We had two of them and on the management of the COVID pandemic. And we continue this year with uh, uh, topics which are specific to uh, medical physics practice, in particular as it applies to uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, I would like to encourage everybody that is attending the webinar uh, to visit our website, uh, to join us in our activities, and to learn about what we are doing. And in addition to that, I mean, next week on Monday, the 22nd, we will have our annual meeting. Everybody is that is interested, it's um, open to attend and to hear what we have been doing over the last year. Uh, so without any further ado, I would like to hand it over to my great friend and colleague, Jake Van Dyke, who, uh, one of the initiators, I mean, of the founders of our organization. Jake, is the floor is yours. Let me stop share. Oh, yeah, yeah you need to introduce. Yeah, I was going to do that. Uh, one second. Okay, sorry. No, no, it's all good. Go ahead, Darjit. Yep, yep, one second. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, perfect. So uh, just a few things. Uh, as you know, today, uh, Dr. Jacob Van Dyke will be giving a talk. Uh, it is about 45 to 50 minutes. We will leave about 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, final comments and thank you. Um, and uh, the webinar is recorded and will be uploaded online at our MPWB's YouTube uh, website, uh, I mean, YouTube uh, channel, and uh, it is shared with the community. Uh, be before I go further uh, or hand over the stage, virtual stage to Dr. Jacob uh, Van Dyke, uh, a few words uh, about him. Uh, Dr. Jake Van Dyke is a Professor Emeritus of Oncology and Medical Biophysics at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. He has more than 50 years of experience in the practical facets of radiation oncology physics, and his research includes multiple aspects of the implementation of modern technology into clinical practice. In 2011, he was awarded the gold medal by the Canadian Organization of Medical Physicists in recognition of his outstanding career. 
in 2014, he was granted an honorary Doctor of Science degree by Western University in London, Canada. He has served as a president of the, of the Canadian College of Physicists and Medicine, participates on the boards and task groups of various organizations, and serves as a consultant to the International Atomic Energy Agency. He is also the main founder of Medical Physics for World Benefit. Um, one last thing, uh, please, uh, we encourage uh, everyone to ask uh, questions. Uh, please write them in the chat and uh, my co-moderator, Sarah, will uh, be organizing all the questions that we will use at, at the end of the talk. So without uh, further ado now, uh, Dr. Van Dyke, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Let me get my um, share screen working. And um, it all takes a minute. I hope that uh, you can see this clearly. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, uh, Arjit, um, Yaakov, Sarah, um, Edward, for um, the invitation to participate in this uh, webinar series um, and uh, for the very kind introduction. Um, so as you heard, the title of this presentation is The Selection of Mega Voltage Treatment Technologies for External Beam Radiation Therapy, um, A Global Perspective. And let me just begin by um, highlighting um, some issues about a global perspective in a very, um, um, uh, well, in a very narrow sense, uh, very brief sense. And that is, we have a range of technologies. And at the high end, we have magnetic resonance imaging LINAC for real-time adaptive radiation therapy. And then a few years ago, there was an article uh, published by the BBC in their news, um, which, and this was the picture from that article, Uganda's only radiotherapy machine is beyond repair. That was in April, 2016. And then the other aspect is that uh, in Africa, uh, which has 54 countries, there are 23 countries that have no radiation therapy at all. So here's the spectrum, the high end to, uh, effectively uh, zero technologies. So that's by way of introduction. And I will now sort of come up with um, uh, my disclosures. I've got a license agreement with Modus Medical Devices uh, in London, Canada. Um, uh, some other comments. Um, I am the editor of the uh, volumes of the Modern Technology of Radiation Oncology, the last of which came out about a year ago, volume four. And then I've been a significant contributor to an IAEA report that is coming out in the near future, um, a guide to selecting mega voltage treatment technologies in external beam radiotherapy. And clearly this title overlaps very much with the title that I've used for my presentation and very much of uh, what I'm presenting can be found in this document. Now that guide is intended to uh, provide guidance to uh, decision makers, administrators, and so on. But it's useful for, for all of us to be directly involved in that uh, decision-making and, and organizational process when we're selecting new technologies. The other thing that it's a bit of an announcement, you might say, is that I'm the editor of a, a book that's about to be published, uh, True Tales of Medical Physics, Insights into a Life-Saving Specialty, and it's uh, being published by Springer in uh, the spring of 2022. The category or genre is a general in interest. And the reason I'm putting it up is because three weeks ago, we had the International Day of Medical Physics. And um, the theme of that day was communicating the role of medical physics to the public. And while I didn't realize it at the time we started producing this book, the True Tales book, which is an edited book, and there's a series of high-level physicists that have written their stories of their uh, medical physics experiences. It's intended to be uh, uh, written at the level of understanding by the general public. So kind of interesting that those themes uh, evolved uh, almost uh, simultaneously, but independent of each other. And then the other thing is that I'm the co-author of a uh, MPWB virtual mentoring survey and I will mention that in a, a bit more detail 
uh, later on, um, because it also ties in with the implementation of uh, technologies. So the objectives of this presentation are to review technological developments in radiation oncology, past uh, and present and future, um, and to address some aspects related to global needs and implementation, to provide specific examples of technology selection considerations. And one of the things that I'm going to emphasize is that uh, implementation of technology is more than just the technology itself. And, and I'll describe what that means. Briefly, an outline, I'm going to go through some background, some different technologies in different parts of the world. And I, and I, I put that in with a question mark. Um, should we have different technologies in different parts of the world? Generic selection process, considerations uh, for the future. And um, it's, it's going to go from a global to a local uh, perspective so that uh, it has some relevance uh, to the local department and not just sort of global statistics. So going back, um, what are the drivers between, behind the technology development? And in chapter two of volume one, uh, we describe this a little bit. And some of the main drivers include the four C's of uh, technology development as, uh, uh, as we have the four R's in radiobiology. Um, but the four C's uh, relate to control rate, cure rate, complication rate, and cost. And so clearly these are issues that relate to uh, development of new technologies. The hypothesis for the new technologies, more accurate dose delivery and better dose distributions yield better clinical outcomes. So the basic strategy is to reduce the treatment volume um, and let me get my laser pointer going here. Um, uh, so it's to reduce the treatment volume, irradiate a smaller volume of normal tissue. And we have the standard sort of ICRU diagrams here, the, the GTV, the CTV, the PTV. And of course, we want to reduce that margin between the CTV and the PTV such that we irradiate less normal tissues. And uh, that allows for uh, higher doses uh, to the tumor, and that in turn uh, reduces normal tissue compl uh, complications or normal tissue toxicity and, and the tumor control probability. So that's sort of the hypothesis of uh, the use of radiation therapy uh, technologies and the newer technologies. And then there's a, a life cycle to the various technologies that, that uh, are around. And, um, this graphic shows um, the business gain on the vertical axis and uh, the cycle that, uh, that this goes through with time on the horizontal axis. And so really there's four phases here. We have the research and development phase um, in which uh, there is uh, no business gain because it costs the business money to go through that research and development process. So that's the development phase. But then we have a rapidly rising uh, phase here, the ascent phase. Once we get the, uh, beyond the development and into clinical practice um, and gets used, then we see that there's a gain to the business. And then eventually there's a maturity phase and a decline phase uh, after um, new technologies come along or after the old technology is outdated. And we had a similar diagram in uh, chapter two of volume one. Uh, now the vertical axis is not business gain, it's attitudinal response, but it goes from invent invention, skepticism, acceptance, elation, state of the art, and then it decreases with disillusion, dis dis uh, disillusionment, despair, and obsolescence. So very similar types of concept. So now let's go back historically. Um, so I've got a graph here of um, radiation oncology, clinical benefit uh, versus time. And um, the clinical benefit could be a variety of things. It could be survival, it could, it could relate to conformality of the dose distributions. Um, this graph, this uh, solid line is mostly a figment of my imagination. So I have made up uh, the solid line, but later on I'll show you that there's two points on the line that are actually real. 
Um, but let's go through this. Um, we first have the discovery of x-rays in 1895, discovery of radioactivity, 1896, and then a phase up to the 40s uh, that has 100 to 400 kilovoltage x-rays, non-uniform dose distributions, high skin doses, brachytherapy was developed. We have radium and radon uh, calculation systems. So that's the early phase. And we see there's some benefit that occurs at that stage uh, of um, radiation oncology. In the 1950s, cobalt-60 was developed, megavoltage x-rays were implemented. We had skin sparing, uh, more uniform dose distributions and manual treatment planning. Then in the 60s and 70s, we went to multi-energy Linux, computerized treatment planning systems and simulators. In the 70s, CT scanning came along. We developed 3D conformal radiation therapy and brachytherapy after loading. And then the 1990s to the 2020s, we have all these uh, acronyms, IMRT, IGRT, adaptive radiation therapy, PET for uh, uh, planning and magnetic resonance uh, for planning, IGRT, protons, carbon ions. So all of these have become uh, quite prominent in the, in the 19s up until uh, the present time. And then the future, that's the big question mark. How is this graph going to look in the future? And I'll talk a little bit about the future later on. Is it gonna go up much or is it gonna be uh, uh, horizontal? And so now I mentioned there were two real points in the 1970s, the overall survival, and I'm gonna show this on the next slide, but the overall survival for all cancers was 50%. In the 2010s, the overall survival was 67%. So we had a significant gain between the 70s and the 2010s. And these are the data that I'm referring uh, referred to, the US uh, SEER data as it's known as, uh, five-year cancer survival rates in the USA. Um, and then uh, all cancers, and that's this summary here, went from 50% to 67%. Um, and then for prostate cancer, it actually went from 68% to 99%. So there's been very significant gains that have been made. And the uh, paper that describes this uh, relates this to early detection and improved treatment. So there is uh, definitely a component of improved treatment that ties in with the developments of the technology. Looking at the global cancer problem uh, in terms of incidence and deaths. So we have here uh, on the vertical axis, millions of people. This is uh, from 2018 to 2040, where the blue bars represent uh, 2018 and the red bars represent 2040. And so we see that in 2018, uh, the cancer burden, the number of new cases, 17 million globally. And in 2040, it's 27.5 million. Cancer deaths, 9.5 million globally uh, in terms of deaths in 2018 and 16.3 million in terms of 2040. So we see an increase, expected increase of 62% um, over the next um, 20 plus years uh, in terms of incidence and an increase of 72% in terms of cancer deaths. <clears throat> now, this is a graphic from the WHO, which looks at deaths, but it divides it by country income level. So we have um, the, uh, the darker shade, the orange shade is low middle income countries and the yellow shade is high income countries. And this is also projected out to 2030. And what we find here is that in high income countries, the increase in incidence is 20%, whereas in low income countries, uh, low to middle income countries, it, the, increase in the increase in deaths is uh, 62%. The point here is that the, the increase is growing much more rapidly in low to middle income countries than it is in high income countries. And that's uh, a point of uh, significant concern. It's also uh, recognized and being addressed by uh, various uh, uh, report uh, activities. So radiation therapy in terms of the incidence and, and deaths, uh, radiation therapy uh, is uh, considered to benefit uh, more than half of all the cancer patients. 
And so radiation therapy is a very significant component of addressing uh, the incidence and, um, and reducing the deaths of, uh, uh, of uh, the incidence of cancer. However, there is a problem. And where the uh, incidence is growing most rapidly, it seems that we have perhaps uh, the, the least amount of access to radiation therapy. So this is a graph, uh, a world map of the percent of patients able to access radiation therapy. And the dark uh, red here is that these countries, um, less than 25% of the patients um, needing radiation therapy have access to it. And the light uh, colors here, uh, and you can see have 100% uh, access in some countries have more than uh, what is needed for 100% of the patient. So, uh, and in Africa, I mentioned earlier already, there's 23 countries that have no radiation therapy at all within the country. So patients have to be sent out of the country for their treatments. So this led into um, a, uh, an activity by the Union for International Cancer Control. They developed a global task force on radiotherapy for cancer control. It uh, was initiated by Dr. Mary Gospodarowicz in 2013. She at that time was becoming the president of the UICC and the activity uh, took place between 2013 to 2015. And the point of the report was to answer the question, what will it take to provide equal access to radiation therapy globally by the year 2035. And uh, it came out as a uh, Lancet Oncology Commission report in September of 2015. And the whole issue of the Lancet Oncology is devoted to uh, this report. I've only got one slide, I think, on uh, that report. And what will it take? Well, this is a summary. Um, and um, a current, meaning when that report activity started, in terms of low to middle income countries, there were 4,200 megavoltage machines uh, in existence. And the question is, what will it take? Future, and the projection was for 2035, um, additional requirements in low to middle income countries. So this is low to middle income countries on its own. It would require 13,000 megavoltage machines to provide equal access to radiation therapy globally. 6,500 CT scanners, 30,000 radiation oncologists, 22,000 medical physicists, 78,000 radiation therapists, and many, many dollars to make all that happen. And of course, these people all need to be trained, um, which to get qualified staff uh, is a, uh, a big investment. And um, now they, this is what it would require. The uh, Global Task Force also set forth a series of uh, uh, specific goals uh, in the interim. And I won't go into detail on those, but um, the, the one included uh, training 6,000 medical physicists by the year 2025. So one of the issues is cost. And I said in the previous slide, it's going to take many, many dollars. So the question is, what are the cost drivers? Uh, and we can break it down into components. And one of them is facilities. Uh, we need to have uh, places to provide radiation therapy. Inside of those facilities, we need equipment. And uh, along with the equipment, we need personnel. So these are three major cost drivers uh, to, uh, that impact the development of radiation therapy. And from that report, what came out was a breakdown of the estimated costs of these three components in different uh, income environments. So we have high income countries, upper middle income countries, low to middle income countries, and low income countries. And then it's divided into equipment, which are the blue bars, uh, the building or facilities, which are the red bars, and uh, salaries uh, or operating costs, which are uh, the green bars. What we see is that in high income countries, 30% of the total costs go into equipment, 6% into building, and 64% goes into salaries and uh, operating costs. 
Whereas in low income countries, 81% of the total cost is equipment and 9% is facilities and 10% is salaries. So there's a huge uh, change in terms of what the relative component costs are depending on what income environment we live in. So this has an impact on the technology decision-making process in terms of how you implement and, and, and the, the ability to implement uh, new technologies in a, a particular uh, country environment and, and dependent on their level of income. The other point I would make is, and that we haven't really addressed very much, but if technologies were to be built in low to middle income countries, then they would also benefit from this variation in terms of the cost. So the salary component, if the technologies were built in, in lower income countries, the salary component would be much smaller uh, than it is in the high income countries. And I was uh, in uh, Iran uh, a few years ago and they were building their own linear accelerator. And their estimate was that it would cost about a third of the price that it would cost uh, in a high income countries. So uh, there is a very uh, significant issue there. I've also got a graphic here of a paper that uh, we produced uh, on the cost per radiotherapy course. We were looking at parameters that impacted cost. And so here we have cost per radiotherapy course in US dollars versus the number of courses per year. And we see that as we increase the number of courses, we have to add a new machine. And this serrated graphic is because every time there's a new machine added, it has an impact on the cost per course. So what this shows is that uh, there definitely is a gain by having multiple machines in the department, although eventually that the, the, the gain in, in terms of uh, lowering the cost uh, decreases, it, it goes horizontal. And um, the, so the cost per course decreases with the number of courses per year, um, but the cost per course decreases also uh, depending on what income environment you're in. So these are high income countries and these are the bottom is the low income countries and the ones in between. I also want to point out that radiation therapy technologies is more than Linux and cobalt machines. Uh, often people think only about mega voltage machines. And uh, we are really, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated process. We have the treatment machines that are needed, but we also need uh, simulators or CT simulators, treatment planning systems, brachytherapy systems, uh, radiation oncology information systems or, or record and verify systems, immobilization uh, devices, dosimetry uh, tools, uh, radiation safety um, devices, and, and some other ancillary equipment. So technology implementation is much more than just looking at linear accelerators and cobalt machines. However, these machines are uh, the biggest cost component of the total radiation therapy uh, process. So, um, and this adds to the idea that uh, technology implementation is more than um, just technology. Um, we need facilities, we need people, we need knowledge on the use of this technology. And this is the skills component, um, basically on the job training of the technologies and new techniques and so on. And then there's an implementation issue. And some of this relates to organizational support and financial resources. And all of these things are interrelated as I've got here. I've, I've div divided them into four components, but all four are interrelated. And if any one of those components is not available, then we have uh, potentially uh, a significant problem. So uh, again, uh, Looking at this from a global perspective, we've just described the incidents, the needs, the global variations, but then it goes down to um, a, a national perspective. Uh, regulatory infrastructure, we, we need a strategic task force to deal with uh, development of the plans for the country, cancer control plan, approval of facility construction, and a, and a regulatory process for radiation safety. And then we come to the local perspective. And here um, we get into some of the details that are in the report uh, also of uh, the IAEA. We need an implementation team. Uh, and that implementation team should have representatives from radiation ecology, medical physics, and radiation therapy. 
And often decisions uh, are made, especially in lower income environments by non-professionals. And this creates all sorts of problems in terms of the practical implementation process. We need to know the incidence of the cancers, uh, the types of uh, cancers. Is it uh, radical or, or palliative uh, predominantly? Um, the numbers and types of machines, the other equipment, the cost analysis. And then there's a planning phase. Uh, we need to design the facility. Uh, we need to consider special procedures, the licensing applications, uh, the various committees that are required in terms of radiation safety and quality assurance, uh, the staff and training process, uh, a clinical protocol development for uh, implementation. So all of these are com components that need to be considered at the local level. So let me now get back to um, the uh, Linux versus uh, Cobalt machine situation, because that's been under a lot of discussion over the years, although perhaps you might say the discussion is uh, decreasing, but it's still there. And uh, one of the major factors is cost. So this goes back to a paper that Jerry Batista and I put together back in um, uh, 1996, Cobalt uh, 60, an old modality renewed challenge. And then John Schreiner in, uh, in the Kingston at the Queen's University uh, has worked on uh, some considerations in Cobalt 60, even uh, applying it uh, as to tomotherapy, so using modern techniques. And then uh, the role of Cobalt 60 in modern radiation therapy, again from uh, John Schreiner. Um, and then there's another paper that came out in 2016 um, and the title is uh, somewhat provocative, Is Africa a Graveyard for Linear Accelerators? And then perhaps uh, <coughs> the uh, most recent paper on comparing cobalt and, and linear accelerators, um, cobalt-60 machines and medical linear accelerators competing technologies for external beam radiotherapy. And this was uh, uh, authored by Brendan Healy and a group from the IAEA. And it's probably the most recent uh, direct and up-to-date comparison uh, of uh, an, an, an advising document on the use of these uh, treatment modalities. Just a, an, a bit of an anecdote here. Um, uh, I was involved with Jerry Batista and Peter Almond in a uh, retrospective review of cobalt-60 radiation therapy. It came out uh, last year in Medical Physics International. Uh, the reason I say this uh, is because cobalt-60 uh, first was used on October the 27th, uh, 1951. So that's uh, 70 years ago. So we had the 70th anniversary celebration because the first patient was treated in London, Ontario. Um, uh, whoops. I don't know if that, I blocked out for a minute there. I apologize. I hit a button on my keyboard that I shouldn't have hit. Um, I'm glad it came back. So the first patient was treated in London, Ontario on the 27th of October, 1951. So we celebrated the 70th anniversary about three weeks ago. And um, the celebration was actually done by um, providing cookies to uh, everyone in the cancer center. And these cookies were printed with the cobalt 60 stamp on it uh, using a technique called edible printing. Um, anyway, just a, a, a bit of an anecdote that uh, we did celebrate the 70th anniversary in the use of cobalt. Now here's the reality of what's happened over the years. So this is the number of cobalts and linax um, based on publications, uh, reported uh, numbers in publications of various sorts. And so it's a bit of a uh, serrated graph, but that's the way the data came out in the publications. So cobalt is the blue line, started in 1951. Linax is the red line. And so we see that cobalt took off quite nicely and it was uh, you know, over 2000 units uh, in the 1980s. And then Linax started slowly, uh, but took off very rapidly in the 1980s and the crossover point uh, was in the mid 1980s, around 1985. And now we can see that we have five or six times as many um, Linax as we have uh, cobalt machines. And clearly the Linac uh, use is increasing and the cobalt use is uh, decreasing. So what are the major factors uh, for considering technology selection for megavoltage equipment? 
I've divided this into four components. And the one is technical factors. The two is cost. Three is available staff uh, and their capabilities of handling these technologies. And four is machine servicing issues. So these are, these are my broad categories. All are important and each has a major impact on the choice of what technology is, uh, is used. So let's look at the technical factors, first of all. Um, technique capability. So whatever technology you choose, and, and uh, this goes beyond Cobalt and, and Linux as well, it's whatever technology uh, is being used. So we, are, are we doing 2D radiotherapy? Are we doing 3D conformal radiation therapy? Do we want IMRT, VMAT, IGRT? and so on. So it's the question. And then there's a, a superb report for anybody that's working in the 2D to 3D to IMRT transition. This report from the IAEA uh, is a phenomenal report in terms of uh, providing a list of questions that you should answer before you can advance to the next level. And it's really uh, nicely outlined in that report. So technique capability is, is the first one, beam characteristics. And this is often what is used to compare cobalt and Linux and uh, other technologies. Penumbra, penetration capability, dose uniformity, depth of maximum dose, the de dose to bone, the dose rate, and so on. And then there's beam shaping. Do we use block trays or do we use multi-leaf collimators or something else? Uh, geometric characteristics, patient collimator distance, isocenter height. Uh, be surprised how much variation is there, there is in the average height of the person throughout the world and what impact isocenter height has on that. And then we need to consider record and verify our ecology information systems, the digital component, you might say, of the technology. Cost factors, I've already uh, alluded to that. Capital costs, uh, bunkers, the facilities, uh, and these are usually prorated over 30 years. Uh, capital cost equipment. And these are usually prorated over 10 to 12 years. And this is the capital cost is what often makes radiotherapy look expensive. But the reality is radiotherapy is less expensive uh, when you consider it on a per patient basis compared to other modes of cancer treatment. And then there's the operating costs, the staff, the infrastructure, uh, like power, water, overhead. And these are generally calculated on an annual basis. And then there's the service maintenance issues. And these could be included under capital costs of the equipment if a service contract is bought up front as part of the equipment purchase. And that's why I've got here, it could be uh, built in for uh, 10 years if that's what the contract says. And that's why the plus or minus is there because it could be... Uh, um, dependent on the contract. Some people might do it for five years, others for 10 years, others for 15 years. Um, and, but it's an annual cost if it's not bought up front or becomes an annual cost after this 10-year contract runs out. So it has to be taken into account. Um, and it's often not considered by administrators who are not aware of all of the details of technology implementation. The IAEA, again, has uh, tremendous resources. Um, this is from their website, Staffing and Cost Calculation. And I'm going to expand this. Uh, they have an, a radiation oncology staffing calculator. They have a uh, radiation uh, therapy cost estimator. And uh, it, these are the staffing estimates. Uh, both of them, they have spreadsheets that one can do calculations to determine the number of staff required and one can do calculations to determine the, the cost of running a radiotherapy facility. Great resources that should be used for anybody that's in the planning phase. This is the staffing document, staffing and radiotherapy and activity-based approach. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have the need for qualified staff. And we need radiation oncologists, medical physicists, radiation therapists. And it's like a three-legged stool. Uh, the stool works well if you have all three components, but if one of the components is missing, radiotherapy will not work. We need all three. And this ties in with education and training for medical physicists. So uh, there's a, an academic component, uh, on-the-job training, residency component, 
and a part of that uh, is a certification process. A graph out of uh, the last volume of the Modern Technology of Radiation Oncology showing the phases of education. So we have the academic education, which is shown here. Uh, first, the undergraduate, or possibly graduate degrees, but then we need graduate education in medical physics, either at the graduate level or complete academic courses at, at the graduate level that tie in with medical physics. And then supervised clinical on the job training, which we often call residency, or in some countries it's called, uh, they're called registrars. And this is usually a two year component. Then we have certification, uh, which then determines clinically qualified medical physicists. And we should not forget about the continuous professional development requirement that uh, maintains our certification. Again, the IAEA has a report on the academic component of uh, postgraduate medical physics education. And now I'm gonna lead a little bit into the medical physics for world benefit training related activities. Uh, there's a project underway under the guidance of uh, Parminder Basran, uh, open syllabus project. Um, it's in, in, uh, in progress and under development. Um, the uh, acronym that's been given for it is the World of Medical Physics, website of open resources for learning and development of medical physics. And it's in a draft form. And as I, it's coming soon uh, is the answer. So how, how did this evolve? Well, I have a chapter in volume three of uh, the modern technology of radiation oncology, radiation oncology, medical physics resources for working, teaching and learning. And it's like a 40 some odd page chapter with all sorts of listings of uh, uh, resources that are available for um, for medical for, for medical physicists. Um, the problem is that it's too much. And um, the question is, how is a resident or a young medical physicist know to know where to look? What is really relevant for him or her at that point in time? And so um, the idea of, and then the other thing is that um, the uh, IAEA has these uh, syllabi, you might say, for clinical training of medical physicists. And, and the first one is uh, in radiation oncology. It came out in 2009. The second one is diagnostic radiology, it came out in 2010. And the third one is for nuclear medicine and it came out in 2011. And in those reports, uh, this is really residency training uh, guidance documents, is a syllabus at the back, Appendix 4, Clinical Training. It shows the topics here, but uh, th this is the front end of it. It's basically the, the, uh, the table of contents. Uh, there's many pages that go into this. In fact, there's close to uh, uh, 60 or so pages uh, showing the details of each of these components. So there's a clinical introduction, clinical aspects of radiobiology, and so on. So there's a detailed syllabus here. So the idea now of this world of medical physics uh, is to take those core elements, uh, what to learn here, core medical physics learning objectives and competency, as for example, is found in the IAEA residency syllabus, and then to look at online resources and to connect the two. So, um, and so the idea is to, to uh, take the points in the syllabus and link it to online resources that are freely available to anybody in the world. And so it's, this is a, a resource that's great for lower income countries, but it's also uh, useful for high income countries as well. So that's a project that's underway and that keep an eye open Hopefully in the early new year, it should be uh, online. The other thing I wanted to mention, the other aspect of medical physics for world benefit that ties in with this is uh, virtual mentoring. So there's a, a project underway to implement virtual mentoring to provide a resource for medical physicists around the globe uh, that they get uh, mentorships uh, organized. Now the, the survey uh, tries to determine what, um, you know, what uh, best approaches are, uh, can be used to uh, provide a virtual mentoring uh, activity. Uh, how do we link uh, a mentor and a mentee, for example? Uh, what are the criteria and so on? So there's, 
So this survey is underway right now. Uh, and uh, anybody listening is encouraged to participate. It's for anyone associated with medical physics. For example, uh, clinical people, academic people, uh, people in industry, government, trainees, students, and so on, both in high income countries and low income countries. And that survey is, uh, you can link to it under the MPWB website. So mpwb.org. And then on the front page, there's news and updates and you'll see the survey link there. Um, so I encourage you to participate in that. So that's the education uh, component of uh, technology implementation. And then there's machine service issues. So first of all, there's a concern about infrastructure and some countries have difficulties with stable power supplies. Uh, and so that needs to be addressed. Availability of service personnel, availability of parts. Uptime, conventionally, Cobalt 60 has been considered to be to have a higher uptime compared to linear accelerators. So Cobalt uh, greater than 99%, Linux greater than 97%. Uh, these are older data for a, a single energy Linux. It's probably much higher than 97% now. Um, but um, more recently, however, some of the newer Cobalt machines have become more digital, more complex. And the question is, does, do they have an increased downtime? And I, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, I don't have the data for it. But I think it does raise the question, especially when you start putting multi-leaf collimators and so on on a cobalt machine. This is the graphic. It's an old graphic, <clears throat> but it illustrates a point. It's cobalt-60 breakdown data uh, in Nigeria from 1980 to 1988. Now, these are a number of days, uh, and this is the year. And what you can see is that in some years, the, the machine was down for 200, over 250 days, which is most of the year. This is cobalt, right? It's supposed to be simple, it's supposed to be. Uh, so anyway, the point is there were no parts uh, or no service and no repairs. And then uh, even uh, cobalt considered a simpler te technology also does not work. Now there's been uh, recent data that came out in 2020, uh, which provide a, a comparative analysis uh, of uh, accelerator breakdowns in the United Kingdom, Nigeria, and Botswana. So a direct comparison, you might say, of different income environments. And so here's the, the, the mean downtime in hours. And these are the subcomponents of the system. Um, and blue is Nigeria, uh, red is Botswana, and, and yellow is uh, the United Kingdom. And you see that uh, in, in just about every case, uh, Nigeria has a much higher uh, downtime compared to the other uh, countries. In fact, Botswana has the lowest downtime, uh, even compared to the United Kingdom, which it provides interesting data. And then on, a, on, a, uh, on the bigger components, this is called um, uh, diagnostics. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we have the, the, the diagnostics really refers to the ion chamber. And here we have a mean downtime of 400 hours um, when the ion chamber goes and it has to be replaced. And that's like uh, 10 weeks um, of downtime. So what the consideration was in the paper that Nigeria had no service contract. And so they had to provide funding for their repairs on the spot. Botswana had a parts and service contract. The United Kingdom had a parts contract only. So you can see the distinction in terms of uh, the outcome of the amount of downtime. If you have a full parts and service contract, you have less downtime compared to a parts contract uh, <clears throat> and uh, no service contract, depending on how much money you have available at the time you have to do the repairs, has a major, major consideration. So this is uh, back to the IAEA uh, guide. Um, and the guide has in it a series of questions. And I don't have time to uh, get into all those questions. And so I'm going to move forward quite quickly. But the point is, they need to be answered to uh, consider um, the, um, uh, the needs and uh, guidance for moving forward. In summary, uh, for comparing Linux and Cobalt, there's no simple answer to the question of the choice of either cobalt or Linux. 
for radiotherapy in low and middle income countries. In fact, radiotherapy department with combination of technologies, including orthovoltage x-ray units may be an option. Local needs, conditions, and resources will have to be factored into any decision on technology taking into account the characteristics of both forms of teletherapy, with the primary goal being the sustainability of the radiotherapy service over the useful lifetime of the equipment. Sustainability is a key phrase here. So what have we got? Well, I'm, I'm going to go through this last, I see I'm running, running out of time, this last part, which is, um, um, I'll go over this fairly quickly. So existing technologies, we have conventional cobalt, modern cobalt, conventional LINAC, modern LINAC with multiple options, and then there's the new hybrid technologies and particle therapy. There is a modern cobalt machine that uh, is um, very much uh, uh, image guided uh, related. It has multi-leaf collimators, provides IMRT, IGRT, co uh, cone beam CT, KV imaging, 6D robotic couch. So we do have modern cobalt with uh, the newer technologies. We have uh, tomotherapy. We have the variant Halcyon in the LINAC environment. They provide a more rapid installation, faster commissioning, and uh, easier workflow. And then we have the newer hybrid technologies with magnetic resonance imaging combined uh, with the LINAC. And uh, two are in clinical operation and two uh, groups are working on it. And then we have, uh, the, this is a summary of what uh, real-time IGRT with magnetic resonance provides. And uh, again, I'm uh, running out of time. One factor, of course, again, is the cost factor that is uh, important. What the latest is uh, a PET a CT LINAC, which is under development in uh, California, along with the Stanford group. And uh, that is now under investigation uh, as a, a way of doing biologically guided radiation therapy. And then the latest uh, research is flash radiotherapy. So flash radiotherapy has extremely high dose rates, uh, about a factor of 500 greater than what we are conventionally used to. It's uh, an interesting radiobiological phenomenon um, with added protection for normal tissues, but with similar tumor response. Um, mechanisms are not fully understood, and it's not always uh, suitable for all types of tumors. Um, there's a limited availability of appropriate uh, radiation sources right now, but that's all under research. So this is uh, their th summary was the currently available data more than justifies further investigations into uh, flash radiotherapy. So some supporting uh, considerations, enabling considerations, artificial intelligence is going to have a significant influence. Uh, we had a, a webinar uh, not long ago on automated treatment planning. And that's one way of uh, providing support for lower to middle income countries. Uh, turnkey installations, uh, tomotherapy and Halcyon provides. Hypofractionation is an enabling consideration as well. It allows more patients to be processed uh, with fewer fractions. And then the future and the hope of flash radiotherapy. So the issues for low to middle income countries, planning and integration of radiotherapy and national health programs, adequate facilities, Funding for up-to-date equipment. <coughs> Excuse me. Trained and staff, uh, trained trained staff and local education uh, uh, training being available within uh, a nearby context. Resources for equipment, parts, and service uh, and service support staff. Uh, new departments start often de novo in low to middle income countries. There are few neighboring clinics around to provide help and guidance in terms of setting up uh, a new department. Multiple resources available uh, from the IAEA. They're free, they're online, uh, and um, they, they are uh, very useful in providing guidance for implement, implementing uh, new technologies. So in summary, the requirements for safe and effective transition um, to new and appropriate technologies needs a response to appropriate questions at the very beginning of the process by administrators and decision makers, by professionals in leadership roles, and that includes radiation ecologists, medical physicists, and radiation therapists. Without the involvement of the appropriate people and answers to the relevant questions, the projects are at a huge disadvantage. So the choice of radiotherapy to technology depends on administrative support and administrative advocacy. 
choice of technical parameters, available resources, qualified staff, availability of stable infrastructure and machine servicing. Um, it, in low to middle income countries, it will take collaboration of multiple organizations. And these are acronyms of multiple organizations. Individually, we are one drop, but together we are an ocean. And with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you. Wow, that was a really good. Um, well, um, just wanted to thank you once again, uh, Dr. Jake Van Dyke, uh, to AAPM, uh, to the board of the MPWB, and most of all, all the participants, about 70 plus today. Um, before we go to the Q&A session, just uh, wanted to let everyone know that uh, please uh, check out the website uh, for MPWB. Um, I highly recommend if you're not on Twitter uh, to sign up, get a Twitter account. And uh, this is a really good resource to communicate with uh, our fellow medical physicists in our community uh, with uh, definitely with MPWB. And uh, it's a really good good and modern uh, networking uh, uh, availability uh, resource for everyone. And um, this is our email and uh, I'll give the floor to my co-moderator, uh, Sarah, uh, who will now ask uh, any Q and A's that uh, question that uh, our participants had today. Thank you, Arjit. Thanks a lot, Dr. Van Dyke. Um, our first question is from Naveed. Uh, he says, can we conclude that LIAC has less downtime in comparison to COVID-60, even in low-income countries? I think it's the other way around, right? LIAC Sorry, has I, I, I missed downtime, you. right? You, you broke up a bit. I missed the question. Right. Yeah, uh, the oh. question is... Uh, can we conclude that LINAC has less downtime in comparison to COBOL-60, even in low-income countries? Um, no, I don't think we- It was we... the other way around, right? Yeah. 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 It was 97% uptime versus 99% for COVID, right? Well, that's, that's data from uh, um, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I, like I said, I don't have uh, the recent data um, but cobalt, again, one needs to ask the, the appropriate questions. It depends on the circumstances. If you're in an environment where you have uh, power and water problems, uh, you know, to have consistency of power and water, cobalt may be uh, up significantly more, may, may have a higher uptime than a linear accelerator. So if, if that is an issue, then that needs to be taken into account. Um, in, uh, in, uh, the other thing that needs to be considered is the modern cobalt technologies, which are more complex. And so I don't have the data on the, the modern technology of uh, cobalt 60. And so there may be a consideration because they're, because they're more complex, they may have uh, a, a downtime that's equivalent to what a linear accelerator has. So one needs to take those factors into account when you're making these kinds of decisions. Isn't the mere fact that cobalt-60 is a radioactive material, um, so it might not be accept, like, if there's some sort of sanction on the country, um, wouldn't that be an issue of uh, de delivering a radioactive material after its half-life, or is that never an issue also? The, there is definitely a radiation safety issue with cobalt-60. Okay. And that, that uh, radiation safety issue occurs at various levels. First of all, the source has to be delivered. And there's uh, one needs to take the regulatory process into account. Uh, some countries uh, don't quite know how to deal with uh, such uh, radioactive sources in terms of delivery. And there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in that process. Yeah. But then also at the end of life, one needs to, to be aware that um, this, this source has to be discarded somehow. And in the past, there have been issues about uh, radioactive sources uh, orphan radioactive sources, as they call them, um, and that have created very significant radiation uh, safety problems. Um, so the, there is a radiation safety issue with cobalt. There's also a security issue. 
that that people have been worried about, and that is, uh, you know, that if the sources get stolen and turned into dirty bombs or something, that that becomes another factor. So there are uh, definitely radiation safety considerations uh, for uh, cobalt-60 that are different than they are for linear accelerators. Normally, they can be overcome. If there's an appro appropriate radiation safety infrastructure in the country, then it's not a real problem. Uh, however, under some conditions, it might be. Uh, the next question is from Arizona. Um, when is it possible to see the mentorships such as the one provided through the RSS Society? So I think I can answer the question. I'm not sure how the mentorship program from the RSS Society is like, the Radio Society, I guess. So uh, which society is that? RSS, he says, so I think Radio Society. Oh, okay, so I, I'm afraid I can't, uh, I don't know enough about that society's mentorship program. Uh, the idea for Medical Physics for World Benefit is to, um, to provide mentorship to those who um, feel they can use support in uh, their clinical environment, right? So the, the, uh, the, uh, the people that have less uh, colleagues in their neighborhood to connect with might want to look for an external advisor uh, to provide support in what they're doing within the clinic. And so um, that is, that is, uh, and then the idea is to set up um, a mentor and a mentee to match the right persons or the right people so that they fit uh, in terms of uh, knowledge uh, requirements and what they're looking for. And so uh, there will be a matching process uh, for uh, that um, by people filling in questionnaires and, and responding to that. Uh, Ivan Stojanovic, uh, is there a radiobiology difference between cobalt-60 energy and <coughs> linac used energies? Um, not really. Um, there's there, the RBE, the radiobiological equivalent is considered to be uh, the same for both cobalt-60 and megavoltage photons from, from uh, linear accelerators. However, uh, once we get into unusual modalities like flash radiotherapy, then uh, things change. And um, then there is, uh, uh, well, it's not clear exactly what the radiobiological differences will be, but there is a radiobiological difference between um, um, uh, the dose rates rather than the actual photon energies. If I may um, add a detail on that, um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, there have been cases in which people use cobalt machines with sources that were way beyond their replacement time, and people using those machines with dose rates which were totally ineffective in radiation therapy. I mean, going down to maybe a third or a quarter or, or an eighth of the standard dose rates. And that's yeah. the other aspect if there is no uh, provision for you know, replacement of sources, which has been documented in some cases. So Yaakov, Yaakov raised a very good point. Um, and in fact, uh, Jack Fowler did some radiobiological modeling when IMRT started. And IMRT initially took uh, significantly longer than uh, usual treatments. And the conclusion was that if treatments took more than a half an hour, there was a radiobiological difference that had to be accounted for. And so what Jakob is saying, if, if a cobalt machine has a very low dose rate and the treatments start taking more than a half an hour, then there's a difference in uh, response uh, of the uh, treatments that take longer than a half an hour compared to the ones that take less than a half an hour. So that's a dose rate phenomenon. So that's, due to, I see. so that's due to the dose rate, though, not due to energy differences. That's right? correct. All right. That's correct. Okay. Um, yeah. um, Arjit has a question. What kind of pushback that you hear from physicists in low uh, middle income countries regarding why does the government not prioritize building radiation therapy clinics for the people? Yeah, that's a, that's a real uh challenge um and that's going to vary from country to country um the problem is they have um 
Well, there's several issues. One is priorities. Uh, and they think that uh, cancer um, is perhaps not at the same priority level as uh, dealing with uh, other diseases and other issues within the country. So there's a priority issue. There's always this um, um, concern about capital costs for radiation therapy that they look at and they think radiation therapy is extremely expensive because there's so much money required up front. Uh, but don't realize that they're, you know, when, once you calculate it out over 20 or 30 years, it really is not that expensive uh, as a modality uh, for, for individual patient treatments. And so there's a whole education process that's required. And, and then there's also the, the uh, political issues uh, where pr priorities are set based on uh, political concerns rather than on uh, practical uh, concerns. So the IAEA does a great job trying to educate um, uh, the governments, the, the member states of the IAEA, um, and uh, they've set up what they call the PACT program, the Program of Action for Cancer Therapy, and uh, will provide um, a review within the country. They call them impact reviews. And that, uh, those reviews help provide guidance to those decision makers that are in those countries. And in some cases that has worked very well, but the country needs to request a review and they need to be interested in it and they need to follow up on them. So um, yeah, it's, it's a tough question. It's an interesting question. It's a tough question to give a straight answer to because there's such a huge variation from country to country. Um, I recall from a previous uh, webinar um, that a cost inflation of uh, linear accelerators was mentioned uh, when speaking about lower middle income countries, I forget. Um, the difference in the price of the Linux, but it was either triple or quadruple what we would pay here in North America. So to me, that was baffling. I don't know if that's one of the reasons or not. The, but my guess is due to corruption, right? Well, that's, that's uh, correct. And I've heard the same stories. And what happens is in the lower, lower to middle, mostly lower income countries, but lower to middle income countries is that there is a uh, third party involved. And uh, so you have the vendor, uh, but the vendor doesn't have salespeople in the country. So you have a third party doing the sales. And then there, so that's one component. And so that third party jacks up the price. And then there's the kickbacks, the, the corruption part of it. Um, and that quite often can go to government officials and so on as well. So by the time all is said and done, uh, you could run into situations where the uh, technology costs a lot more than it does in North America or, or the Western world. So yes, uh, it is an issue in some places. Um, I heard you were mentioning the biology guided uh, radiotherapy. It's, uh, it's all private, it's commercial already. Uh, we're receiving ours actually at UPMC towards the beginning of next year, I think. It should be general approval, so we're excited. I think Stanford already has one, so that's exciting. That's, that, that would be the PET CT machine. Yeah, so, great, excellent. I'm looking forward to hearing about the results. Yeah, same here, same here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that's it. Well, there's a lot of, um, so many messages thanking you, Dr. Van Dyke, uh, for the great presentation and uh, from you also, warm thanks. And it's great seeing you again. Uh, you probably don't remember me, but uh, I was, um, I was much younger then, and I was in Saudi Arabia, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, when you came to visit Saudi Arabia. And we went to the desert together. Uh -huh. I don't know if you recall. Yeah. But it's great seeing you again. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. thank you for inviting me, and it was my pleasure. And thanks for the presentation, Jake. And I want to remind everybody to join us at mpwb.org. Uh, to see what we do and to attend our meetings and webinars. I think this is probably going to be the last one during this year. So if we don't see you soon, uh, happy holidays and happy new year to everybody. Happy holidays. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.